This conference will now be recorded. I ask everyone to kindly keep your cameras off and mics muted for the duration of the event. I would like to acknowledge our CIM GTA West co-chairs, Mary Murray and Phil Consilla, and on behalf of the CIM GTA West, I would also like to thank our gold sponsors, SGS, for their support and continued sponsorship of our branch. SGS is the world's leading inspection, verification, testing, and certification company, recognized as a global benchmark for quality and integrity. SGS provides a comprehensive range of analytical services using their network of state-of-the-art laboratories for a wide range of industries, specifically supporting the mining and metals industry through analytical bench scale and pilot plant offerings. Sarah Wilson and Yasha Chaguli, both CIM office bearers, will be happy to receive your queries. Their details are on the CIM website. If your company would also like to become a sponsor of the CIM GTA West Branch, we would love to hear from them. Before I introduce our speaker today, Hugh de Sousa, I would like to draw your attention to the comments bar on the right. You will see it on the top right hand corner and during Hugh's presentation, you will have the opportunity of typing your questions into this comments bar. We will not be taking live questions. At the end of the presentation, we will have a Q&A session where Hugh will answer your questions. Please continue to type your questions during this Q&A session. We are happy to welcome Hugh de Sousa. Hugh de Sousa has over 30 years of experience in the minerals industry. He has a BNA honors in environmental sciences, an MS in geochemistry, and a PhD in geology. Hugh, currently the director minerals technical services has been with SGS for 20 years, starting as a general director of XRLA laboratories and expanding his skills and experiences as chief geochemics and manager diamond services. He has managed SGS geochemical, mineralogical and diamond labs over the last 20 years and has worked on the development of new mineralogical and geochemical methods for mineral exploration. Prior to that, he was with the Ontario Geological Survey and carried out postdoctoral work at the universities of New Brunswick and Geneva. What you don't know about Hugh, though, is that he is a passionate soccer fan. On the weekends, you can find him supporting the Tottenham Hotspur FC or Spurs. Hugh joins us from Toronto, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the CIM GTA West. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and thank you to the CIM GDA West for the invitation to do this presentation on MMI, uh, soil geochemistry, which is just one of the geochemical tools that uh, we offer within our geochemistry labs. Uh, let me see. Uh, okay. So, uh, before I launch into the presentation, I just want to say something about SGS. Uh, as uh, was mentioned, uh, it's a leader in the uh, testing inspection certification business. Uh, very large number of employees, you know, and uh, frequent acquisitions. So that number of employees is growing, and uh, you know, a global, truly global network of offices and labs, uh, and uh, you know, tries to provide a lot of expertise locally. So we've just had some type of reorganization within SGS and uh, we are now part of a natural resources group that includes uh, mining, oil and gas, uh, agriculture and so on. And what we do in, in the mining sector is, you know, provide services in everything from early exploration to the development uh, uh, you know, development of metallurgical flow sheets, for example, through our Lakefield uh, lab or a Burnaby lab in operational support. Uh, we do a lot of trade work that originally was how SGS started in 1878. And increasingly, we are getting into this recycling uh, testing. So, we, you know, one of our newest ventures is battery recycling. And uh, again, we, you know, we venture into consumer use uh, in certifying products and what goes into those products. Uh, 
to make sure, for example, they don't come from uh, conflict uh, zones. Um, we have, as I said, very large uh, footprint, you know, our, for minerals. Uh, we, our center is, is in Lakefield, uh, and in each continent we have a major lab and then a lot of mine site labs uh, uh, serving the mining industry at uh, where they're sort of pr producing material. So looking at uh, what I'm going to try and do in this presentation today, uh, just to review, you know, the overall exploration targets uh, in 2021, because every year, you know, there's a focus on different metals. Uh, this year is proving to be uh, where people are looking at everything and that uh, we are frantically busy, in fact. Uh, and I'll try and describe what the MMI process is, because, you know, I think in this audience, uh, not many of you are have a geochemistry background, so I want to uh, talk a little bit about uh, what MMI does, uh, some of the packages we have, and some of the new developments, particularly for vegetation, uh, that uh, we have uh, brought forward this year. And then, you know, we'll look at a few case studies uh, for gold uh, and for critical metals, because we're just focusing on, on, on those areas in this talk. And, you know, I'd like to talk, uh, to thank Dr. Mark Federico, who we've worked with, I think, since the late 90s, when he was with the Manitoba Geological Survey. He's done, he has incredible field experience in, and uh, application of uh, MMI studies. And uh, in some ways, I was just saying to Mark, this is uh, like, uh, you know, collected version of uh, Mark's uh, geochemical work over the years in a variety of terrains. Um, so let's look at the financings because I mean, essentially, you know, the money drives our business uh, and we've seen, you know, quite a lot of fluctuation, but, uh, you know, 2020 has turned out to be, you know, a, a high point in, particularly in gold uh, um, financings. And we're seeing that as we go into 2021, uh, the gold financings have been uh, maintained, but we're seeing significant growth. If you look, at the last bar there, we're seeing significant growth in base metals and unusually in specialty commodities, which I assume covers all of these critical metals, because I think it suddenly dawned on people that uh, we have a shortage of, of these critical metals. If, as uh, politicians uh, keep saying that we are going to go to an electrification of our system, we're gonna focus on renewable energy, uh, that uh, fossil fuels are gonna pay, pay a smaller part in, in our economy, then there are going to be severe shortages of a whole bunch of critical metals that are important to technological development. And, you know, it's, it's uh, good at this point to reflect on what critical elements are or cr critical materials, because every country defines them differently. You know, Canada has just produced uh, something like uh, 30 critical materials, you know, Includes everything from potash to to other things like rare earths, uh, you know. Uh, so their definition may be different to what the European Union has or what the U.S. has. But within the scientific community, I think what we take it to understand essentially is that these are uh, key elements to new technologies that they're uh, uh, prone to supply disruptions, uh, that production is limited because there are not primary producers of these metals. And there are problems of geopolitical manipulation. You know, we saw probably 10 years ago when the Chinese suddenly restricted uh, access to rare earths, you know, the price spiked incredibly high. And uh, ever since then, everybody has been trying to find alternate sources of rare earths. So although it's the processing of these rare earths that's important. But, you know, when we when we look at um, uh, what they are, the things like lithium, the rare earth elements, uh, gallium, indium, tungsten, but the platinum group elements are quite important. Uh, we've seen, you know, rhodium prices, for example, spike incredibly in the last little while. Cobalt, uh, mainly because of the sources, you know, people want to find alternate sources to the DRC because of a variety of issues there. And, you know, there's... Uh, a bunch of other metals, you know, vanadium could be one if it's uh, proven to be a good battery metal. 
And when you think about the applications, you know, in in uh, as we go to renewable sources, we need uh, and we go to electrification, increased electrification, we're going to need a huge amount of copper. So even though copper is quite abundant, uh, it could be in short supply very soon if uh, you, we don't have uh, new sources of copper. And we see that when we look at electric uh, vehicles, uh, the amount of critical metals that go into them easily of the order of 100 uh, kilos in there and you know very much more in in the defense technologies and say an f-35 and you know a completely huge range of elements potentially um <clears throat> i like to show this periodic table which is uh, from the eu chemical so society because it just shows the abundance and the size of each box of each element uh, Fortunately for us, lots of lots of oxygen out there. Um, but you know, the redder the color, the more restricted the supply, and that's for a variety of reasons. You know, you may not agree with anything, everything that it shows. For example, you may say, well, zinc, doubtful that it's a serious threat, but you know, we don't know what the zinc supply is in aggregate. Uh, um, but for a bunch of other elements, uh, you know, there could be problems uh, in accessing them. And then for one particular use, uh, a smartphone, it just shows the range of elements that are required in the construction of smartphones in the in the uh, in the electronics, in the in the little the chips that that make them uh, so smart. We need an incredible array of uh, elements in their use, and you know, trying to ensure that there is a good supply of these. Uh, elements can be a problem. We've seen recently the impact, uh, you know, in chip shortages, how it's impacted, say, the automobile sector uh, because of a variety of issues associated with the supply because of the COVID issue. Um, the other thing that I'd like to <clears throat> point out is this uh, concept, um, you know, provided by these two authors listed there, the wheel of metal companion, companion uh, <laughs> which I can pronounce it, companionality. Uh, as a geochemist, I would say it's geochemical associations. Uh, so when we look at something like uh, nickel, you know, there are certain elements that are associated with them. You know, copper might have arsenic, uh, uh, antimony, bismuth associated with it in copper porphyries. And as a geochemist, we look at those elements uh, to to trace uh, processes in say copper porphyry or in nickel sulfides, you know, we use a whole bunch of elements, but increasingly we can look at these elements as byproducts that uh, you might have missed them during the characterization phase, but uh, suddenly when there's a shortage, you look at what else you can extract. And there's an interesting um, uh, program at CANMET that is looking to, you know, extract everything from the, wa from the waste stream. Uh, uh, we've seen a recent example of that at the Rio Tinto plant in Quebec, where they've opened, uh, they process primarily uh, titanium there, but they've opened a scandium uh, processing plant. Uh, so that goes to show that, you know, in many of these deposits, they're polymetallic. Uh, they have a range of other elements, depending on the geochemical processing, there may be local <clears throat> concentrations of these elements uh, that might be used for extraction. but from an exploration point of view, we also look at those elements to give us clues, pathfinders uh, to these main commodities. And, and that's what we look for in our surface soil geochemistry, these, these metal associations. Um, okay, just turning now to MMI and what it is. It's a process that was developed by Alan Mann and Russ Birrell in Perth, Australia in the mid 90s. And, Alan always calls this the son of Bleg. Bleg is a bulk leachable extractable gold uh, where you take uh, kilogram size samples of uh, stream sediments and use a cyanide leach to extract the gold. And it, and it works quite well in different terrains, in, in tropical terrains. But what has been astounding in the last year or so is the number of inquiries from Canadian explorationists for black type analysis. Uh, it's, it's quite interesting that uh, they're starting to use a range of different geochemical techniques uh, because it's becoming harder to find uh, some of these primary, uh, primary commodities, but also because um, we're seeing an increase in greenfields exploration 
Um, so there, the other influences is the Russian technique, CHIM, where they buried electrodes in the ground and in, in acid, and they collected ions coming up to the surface. Um, this earth gas concept that the Chinese have used uh, frequently, and they, you know, it operates in a similar manner to CHIM. And things like the Swedes, Malmquist and Christiansen had, they had membranes over the soil uh, where they left them out for three or four months, went back, collected them, and they were able to see base metal anomaly. So all of that experimental work, you know, 70s, the 80s, the 90s, indicated that there was a process there where metals were coming up uh, to the surface. And what Alan and Russell did, you know, and they worked with us in the mid 90s, uh, was defined that uh, a depth at which in the soil where you could actually sample this. So uh, putting membranes out or burying electrodes can be slightly cumbersome because you have to leave them there for a long time and come back. Whereas we started to use the soil itself as a collector of these metal ions. And, you know, just as, a, as an aside, I should add, Barringer, some of you might may remember, was a very famous uh, inventor, uh, geochemist, and uh, in the 70s, he had uh, he was flying aircraft uh, with uh, airborne instrumentation that were analyzing gases and had sticky paper, you know, collecting particles, which you would analyze later. So, you know, even airborne, this flux of elements was, was uh, potentially uh, measurable. Um, and, you know, I think in these days with drones, we're going to see a lot more of that. But the MMI technology is focusing primarily on the soil layer. And, and what we do is we, we uh, shallow at a sa very uh, uh, sample at a very shallow depth. Uh, we take a large sample. We're collecting 250 grams, and our sample size is 50 grams. Uh, we use a weak partial leach, which I will explain, and uh, very sensitive ICP MS analysis because we are analyzing at the part per billion level. So this is a typical soil profile in, um, say, northern Ontario. Uh, standard exploration practice is to sample uh, B horizon, but the depth can vary as you go along the profile. And what we do in MMI is sample at a, at a shallow fixed depth of 10 to 20 centimeters. And very often that is in this leach, in bleached horizon. And that has been anathema to many, uh, you know, traditional users of geochemistry, you know, because they feel that you've lost all the metals out of there. But we've been able to show that we actually get a very good response uh, for a variety of reasons because of this metal flux, because we see that layer uh, over here as the interface between the soil, between the upward flux from a deposit deep down, and this is where it meets the, the atmosphere and goes up on. So people like Barringer in their flying uh, uh, machines could be able to sample that, that up the stream. In the soil, what we're essentially looking for are ions, which are generally in uh, the soil poor wa waters. They are weakly complexed, absorbed onto organic or iron oxide uh, um, materials in the soil on soil particles. Uh, and they can easily be removed or desorbed with a strong complexing agent, a, a ligand. And when it dries out, you know, they precipitate out on the surface of the soil. Uh, but over time, you know, these um, ions become absorbed into the soil. Uh, so they become bound or, and uh, they are, they then travel with the soil particle. Uh, the unbound ions remain you know, wherever they are when they arrive, and they don't move with the soil particles because there is a movement of soil particles uh, over time. Uh, so this, this lateral mechanical uh, transport can smear out the an anomalies. So while we focused on these weakly bound ions or weakly attached ions is because they give us access to uh, uh, the recently arrived ions. So, you can see it as a kind of selection process. We are trying to separate out by a chemical process these weakly bound ions. Um, and we use a special extraction liquid, uh, which is a ligand-based soil extraction. 
uh, and collect the top of the weekly bound line, and that is analyzed by our ICPMS. So that import that's the most important point about MMI. It's a weak extraction. Um, and what you see when you start to use these unbound ions is very sharp anomalies because you're just uh, you know, uh, removing these, these unbound ions at the interface. But if you go after the bound ions using a stronger leech, like say Acoregia, you'll get a smeared out uh, um, anomaly, sometimes no anomaly at all because everything is, is smoothed out by the process of lateral uh, transportation mechanically. Um, this is just a quick comparison between uh, what we call digestions, which actually dissolve uh, the soil particles, so rock. Uh, so we, it's things like uh, um, acids, uh, dilute nitric acid, hydrochloric acid, and they can be selective and non-selective. So if you use something that is selective, you can use an acid acetate that will just dissolve uh, carbonates or hydroxylamine hydrochloride, for example, that will dissolve just manganese or iron oxides. And then we go into extractions, which do not dissolve the soil particle, uh, but uh, they just uh, remove weakly bound ions. So there are, again, selective things like sodium pyrophosphate, which focuses on organics, and non-selective. So MMI is a non-selective extraction. Uh, and does not dissolve the soil uh, particle itself. Um, the other thing that I should explain what is contained in the MMI uh, solutions are ligands. Uh, these are strong complexing agents. Uh, they could be ligands such as cyanide, which is you know, very good at uh, extracting gold. Uh, but also copper. So they all they do is dis dissolve or detach and keep them in solution. Uh, and uh, it's important to keep them in solution because reabsorption is always an issue. So you can extract the gold, and then as you feed it in the plastic tube to the ICPMS, if you don't have something that keeps it in solution, it, it drops out onto the walls of the plastic uh, tubing. So that kind of negates, uh, you know, it reduces the amount of uh, ions that you're able to extract. So that 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 is a, an important effect. So it's one reason we don't use distilled water, for example, in our extractions, because distilled water is a very powerful extractant. You know, it, uh, it extracts a lot of ions, but it does not, it cannot keep them in solution. So if there's a more attractive uh, interface, like a plastic tubing, it, the gold will, will drop out on that plastic tubing if you're using uh, distilled water. So we're just using these ligands, which uh, you can see maybe think of as little magnets that are attracting the ions of interest. And why we go for this weak leach uh, is explained in this slide. So uh, we're looking uh, to improve the signal to noise ratio. When we use a strong leach, say we, we extract copper from everywhere, and there's a very big copper signal. But when we use a weak leach, the copper signal is much reduced, but the anomalies stand out much more. So the signal to noise ratio is much better and it enables us to see these anomalies more easily. So there's, there's, a, there's, a, better, uh, there's a benefit from this in improved signal to noise of ions that have recently arrived from the um, uh, mineralized body. Uh, this is this slide is just to show you the Chimera work. This is an independent study done on a variety of leeches and so on, and just shows you the effectiveness or the strength of uh, a leech. And we see distilled water versus enzyme leech versus MMI versus Acoregia, which is the standard was the standard industry leech at the time. And you can see that for zinc, yeah. MMI, you know, is orders a couple of orders of magnitude lower than uh, acoregia extraction, and, and the same, you know, with uh, with copper. You see that acoregia again, a uh, couple of orders of magnitude higher than, uh, say, an, or one order at magnitude higher than the MMI, and you know, the the low abundance of ions in what we extract with MMI is why we have to use the sensitive ICPMS to measure them. 
Um, so just to summarize that, uh, you know, we are using a weak extraction with strong ligands. Uh, we are using this on material that's at the interface between the soil and, and the air or the atmosphere. Uh, and that depth, you know, around the world uh, is, you know, 10 to 25 centimeters. Uh, now, in Canadian situation in boreal uh, forest PD areas, we have to get beneath the organic layer. So, you know, sometimes that can be quite, quite deep. Uh, and when we get into very PT areas, we have a lot of problems uh, with uh, sampling, which is why, you know, we've developed another approach to it, which I'll talk about a bit later. A bit later. So in the absence of an orientation survey, we recommend 10 to 25 centimeters below this organic inter uh, interface. And it's always good to do an orientation you know, prior to a very large uh, uh, study. Uh, looking at what we have, we, the common package these days is this MMI-M. It's a general extraction. It's got about 53 elements in it. Uh, uh, then we have other packages, uh, MMI-ME, which uh, we focus on elements like chromium and vanadium, which are not so good in this MMI-M package. But we can also do uh, selected elements for oil and gas exploration, uh, you know, halides like iodine and bromine, and can also measure ure uh, lead isotopes, which are quite important in uh, uranium exploration, because through the lead isotopes, we can differentiate between uh, lead that has arrived from a uranium deposit and lead from a granitic deposit which is not non-mineralized so that's that's quite important uh the more recent packages uh are mmi mp which is for it's a low it's a very good a very low detection limit package for precious metals gold silver platinum palladium which are uh, very low in abundance and uh we've also done work on agriculture so one of some of our projects are looking at uh, nutrient yields in uh, in vineyards and we've seen significant differences uh you know because it turns out that mmi as a weak extraction can predict what it is that plants are going the roots are going to pick up and uh in vineyards that turns out they have a big influence on the yield uh on the overall quality and uh, on the taste profile so that's kind of a really interesting project uh, which we're working with a group in Kelowna. So we're doing the MMI extract, seeing what is in the soils, and sometimes we see significant differences in the vineyards. And then we can come in with uh, you know specific uh, fertilizers uh, to to augment uh, any deficiencies that might uh, be identified by the MMI process. So that that's a brand new service that we are trying to develop. The latest package is this MMI MV, which is applied to vegetation. Uh, uh, and uh, I'll explain the context of that as I go along. Just to see on a periodic table, you know, we are really measuring most of the elements in the periodic table, you know, of importance to this particular talk is, uh, you know, gold, uh, uh, but also many of the critical metals, whether they're rare earths, uh, whether the elements like, uh, say, cadmium or platinum palladium or, or cesium, uh, those can be important in a, in, a, in a critical metals exploration package. One way we've had most experience is in uh, looking for lithium. Uh, and this gives you an idea of the detection limits. You know, so for gold, it's, it's extremely low, 0.05 parts per billion, you know, um, if you try and envisage that in a one kilo, say, uh, uh, sack of rice, you know, it's probably the end tip of that or half of the end tip of a one grain of rice. It's, it's 0 0.05 ppb is an extremely small quantity. And of course, you know, these soils can be easily contaminated. So we advise clients when they're, you know, collecting these soils to you know, make sure that they don't wear jewelry, for example, because, you know, a gold ring, for example, could contaminate a soil sample. 
So just looking uh, you know, at one of our earliest case studies, this was MMI gold study in the CN Lake area in uh, Manitoba, northern Manitoba. Um, there was indication there that uh, there were base metal uh, uh, showings in the area. And uh, you know, this is kind of Thompson, Thompson mine in Manitoba is kind of northeast of, of, this, of this area. Uh, so initially, the, the um, exploration focused on seeing if there was a continuation of that Thompson mineralization, but uh, they found some gold anomalies. And so they, they carried on doing MMI work in the area, and they showed these very, very weak uh, gold anomalies. Uh, they were, the, the anomalies were of the size of 0.4 ppb, which is incredibly small, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, if we had the MMI MP package, we probably could have done a better definition of some of these gold anomalies, but we defined with MMI this uh, gold zone uh, in a very, very difficult terrain. Okay, it was, uh, it had peat, it had 15 meters of clay, a lot of sand, it was mixed till uh, and very hostile to geochemical sampling. And then, uh, you know, there was uh, 25 meters of uh, rock, volcanic and sedimentary rock, um, and, uh, you know, many abandoned holes during the initial exploration. But the targets were defined by the MMI study, as you saw in the previous slide. And uh, when it was eventually drilled, you know, there were some pretty good intersects in, in a very hostile terrain where no sufficient geochemical uh, work had succeeded previously. Um, and so that's that was one of the first successes of the MMI uh, process. Uh, a much later one, this is uh, 2012, is the Rainy River Intrepid Discovery. Um, they were looking for extensions to the initial discovery and open pitch, which was planned to be developed in this area here. You're looking at the magnetic map and the outline of the open pit. So they, they looked at some of the magnetic lows in the area. Uh, and uh, they initially, in the discovery of the Rainy River, they had used uh, gold grain chemistry or gold grain uh, extract. Okay, so, uh, and so they had this older gold grain data, but uh, in 2012, they, they used MMI and they were able to delineate a zone. So these are in purple, uh, the MMI responses. This is on the magnetic map, this is on Google Earth. And we can see that in relation to the gold grain chemistry. So if you're looking for targets, you know, if you'd gone with the gold grains, you you, you probably would have been off target uh, because the old body is, the mineralization is dipping to the south uh, uh, and south, southwest approximately, but it subcrops along this trace. And that subcropping area is defined by the MMI anomaly. So that MMI anomaly is different from the gold grain anomaly because the gold grains are displaced by the glacial processes relative to the anomaly. So what the key thing about MMI is that it, it is able to identify a target, okay, from surface soil geochemistry. Here we just see the, uh, the mineralized zone, uh, which actually extends to, to under the glacial till. Uh, and some of the intersects within that uh, mineralized zone. Uh, you know, these, these intersects were quite important. And it's interesting to note uh, last year that they came out with a new feasibility study where they reduced the size of the Rainy River project, but the focus was on this intrepid discovery and it's going to be part of the underground development in, in that area. So. Uh, you know, discovery in the long run turned out to be quite important in that particular project. Um, another discovery is, uh, or extension was done at the Marigold mine in uh, Nevada. Uh, it was a small mine and they thought there was, you know, possibilities of extension outside of it. They did some MMI surveys. Um, one of the points here is just to see that the MMI responses in a you know, more arid terrain such as uh, Nevada is much better than you get in uh, in Canada. So, as in the Hunt transect, you saw that the anomaly was 0.4 ppb, 
Uh, in uh, Nevada, it's you know five, five to ten ppb, and we see that these responses defined uh, gold occurrences outside of the mining areas. Uh, these are a couple of trans transects over over the areas, uh, and eventually uh, there was enough found there for them to extend the mine, so that we were able to go back and look at you know how these MMI um, uh, responses correspond to the you know the ore zones. It was it was not quite one to one. You know there is a displacement of of the uh, MMI um responses you know in some areas and that is an area that we need to focus in the years to come is you know how do these occurrences at depth translate into a geochemical soil anomaly of the surface so the, the process of creating that anomaly is not fully understood uh, and we you know we try and do experiments to uh you know see how ions move in the subsurface um, one of the things that spurred us uh, to development of this MMI in vegetation was the difficulty of collecting samples, uh, soil samples in marshy areas. So you can have a transect that starts off in a very sandy area in an ESCA or whatever, but as you extend it, as you go along the line, you might come into a very boggy area <coughs> where it's difficult to see where the soil ends and uh, where the organic material ends and where the soil begins. <coughs> Excuse me. This is typical of some of this very oozy material we were collecting in one stage. So we, we you know, looked at uh, just using the MMI extraction on vegetation, uh, on many trees and so on growing in that area. And uh, with Mark Federico's help, we, we conducted some pilot projects. Uh, as you can see, <clears throat> you know, we've got uh, quite a lot of elements in there in the package. Uh, for elements like arsenic, uh, gold, we still have detection limits. Uh, <coughs> and the application uh, that uh, was tried out in this case study in northern Manitoba uh, near Leaf Rapids. Uh, where there is very limited outcrop over a uh, cesium, lithium cesium tantalum niobium pegmatite, uh, generally known as LCT pegmatites, which are a big target these days because of their lithium uh, um, content. You know, several of them, several percent lithium. So we've seen a number of projects uh, looking to extract lithium. Um, so in this area, there are abundant uh, glacially derived sediment cover, you know, 20 meters thick in places. Uh, the issue there is the ground is only thawed for a very short period, so it's extremely difficult to collect soil samples because the ground is so hard. Uh, so you know, it's uh, uh, we looked therefore with um, with Mark at, at collecting uh, vegetation samples in this particular area. The species that was chosen were alders, and we just uh, focused on older twigs. So in vegetation surveys, you know, if you say you're collecting a particular uh, material, if it's bark, you should stick to bark. Or say spruce bark is maybe a, a particular material, you should stick to it for uh, all of your collection uh, in, in a particular area. In this case, uh, we just collected older twigs. Uh, and you can see over here, bubble plots on Google Earth uh, for a variety of elements in this image here. Uh, over here is a, the overall response in the area that was sampled, where the color, red color indicates a very strong response. Uh, this gives you a summary of the data in that claim for 50 samples uh, for a limited number of elements, gold, uh, silver, bismuth, cesium, lithium, and tantalum. Um, and, and here we're looking at, you know, differences in mobility so that you see that, you know, expressed in the minimum and maximum, where it's for things like tantalum or gold, the amounts that you measure are very low, but uh, for more mobile elements like lithium and cesium, we, we get a much better response, a much higher response. Um, 
So sometimes it's it's good to look at these element associations because um, mm -hmm. you know if you're you're looking for tantalum uh, pegmatites, you probably you know might have issues measuring it properly. Uh, but uh, you can use maybe the cesium as a proxy. Uh, and you know as we said for critical metals, you know if you've got uh, certain amounts of lithium, we might look at extracting down the road cesium and lithium as you process that uh, um, material. Uh, so we can look here in, in uh, geochemical responses between a very mobile metal such as lithium, you're getting pretty good response that is defining the trace of this pegmatite uh, versus tantalum, which is not so good, uh, you know, just one major response. Uh, um, but that's a function of elemental mobility, and that's why we determine you know, 53 elements, so that gives us a good choice of uh, proxy elements. And this shows you then plotted on, on the Google uh, Earth of the plot. Um, so this uh, uh, method overall, the MMI MV, indicates that it's viable for vegetation samples. Uh, and uh, where collecting soil samples has been problematic, we can now we now have uh, an alternate uh, method using vegetation that can fill in the gaps and that can be quite important. Um, just uh, transitioning to some other critical metals again. This is a case study uh, over a pegmatite that we uh, sampled uh, with soils in uh, Manitoba. It was owned by the Thompson brothers. And here we were looking at the differences in depth. So we we're looking, uh, you know, our, our preferred depth is 10 to 20 centimeters, but as you can see, the different metals, so this is lithium, peak at different depths, and that's a function of the geochemistry of these metals. So lithium is good at this depth, uh, uh, cesium, cerium is at this depth, and rubidium at, at a much shallower depth. But were you to sample at different depths, you, you would get a very confused uh, map geochemically. So we, we sample at a constant depth, even though the signal for specific elements may not be as good, but all of the elements are present at that interface position. Um, and what we see, what, what happens when, uh, when this is done, is that you know, we get a very good indication of uh, where the pegmatite uh, might be. So this is uh, lateral profiles for the MMI-M survey. Um, and we can see that uh, for lithium, uh, this is where we knew the pegmatite was. And this one is where there was potentially another body lying buried at depth. And we see that in the other metals as well. So that's uh, lithium at, uh, to that. Uh, um, in, in, in a number of different areas that indicating this hidden uh, and significantly higher lithium bearing pegmatite body. Uh, so we can use MMI to map out the extension of uh, lithium pegmatite. Uh, in many of these areas, there's, consider there's considerable deformation. So some of these uh, pegmatite bodies have been uh, structurally displaced. Uh, this is an example from uh, uh, Australia, uh, Eastern Australia, in the Mount Isa area by R Richard Lilly. And uh, the only point I'm trying to make here is that whereas the target would have been, you know, lead zinc, uh, when you use MMI, and they used MMI in the deeper cover as because it was an effective method, there's a whole bunch of other metals that are present in these targets. And particularly when you're looking at things like IOCGs, uh, you know, you, 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 you get uh, rare earth uh, abundances, uh, which could be potentially significant. Uh, you get uranium, uh, iron ore, obviously. Um, in one of the well-known uh, IOCGs, Olympic Dam, you know, potentially some of the extractable minerals are rare earths, uh, certainly uranium, and there's a whole bunch of other metals that could be extracted if you're looking at trying to augment uh, crit critical metal supplies. But in the initial MMI, uh, in the initial exploration, you can use MMI to identify some of these, these metals, uh, as, as we see here in the metals listed. Uh, so 
this is that companionality or geochemical association. Pieces of geochemists, it's easier for me to pronounce. Um, switching to another commodity, it's uh, kimberlite. We used quite a lot of MMI studies uh, for kimberlite uh, uh, identification, and it turned out to be a very sensitive tool. Uh, so kimberlites are very odd in their geochemical profile because they have uh, ultramafic uh, major element chemistry, so that they're rich in magnesium, chrome, and so on, but their minor elements uh, show high level of incompatible trace elements, and in particular, lanthanum and cerium are much elevated in kimberlites. So you can use that as a signal to identify uh, kimberlites from, from uh, um, say, granitic bodies, which are also enriched in rare earths. But the reason I'm highlighting this is, you know, kimberlites are alkaline rocks, and alkaline rocks are one of the sources of rare earth elements. So we see that, for example, the Thor Lake body in, in Nechalacho, you know, some of the strange lake occurrences, they're all in, in evolved cyanitic uh, alkaline uh, phases in alkaline rocks. So th those are one of the key uh, areas we target for rare earth uh, uh, elements because uh, unlike the carbonatite sources, which are enriched in lanthanum and cerium, the light rare earths, these alkaline rocks have uh, much uh, more interesting uh, quantities of the heavier rare earths, and in particular, you know, dysprosium uh, and neodymium are can be important in some of these rocks. So they're going to be an important target going down the road because those two elements, neodymium and dysprosium, are really critical in terms of battery production and critical in terms of all of the defense applications. Uh, you know, everything from uh, um, you know, smart screens onwards, and so I'm just using kimberlites as an as a as a way of showing how effective MMI can be in the hunt for uh, some of these critical metals. Uh, so this was a, a study in the Kirkland Lake area where we had the kimberlite in the central area surrounded by sort of granitic bodies, which also would have had high rare earths. This is the kind of response we're seeing the major element response of uh, things like magnesium, chrome, and cobalt from the kimberlite, but we're also seeing a rare earth response, lanthanum and cerium, at the flanks of the kimberlite, quite clearly identifying this. And using this this approach, we were able to identify even thin, very thin dikes of kimberlite away away from the main body. I also looked at it uh, in a sort of a different way, looking at uh, rare earth chondrite, which tends to uh, smooth out the noise you see. We had some rare earth data on the actual kimberlite material, just a few elements. Uh, um, sorry, I'm just going to have to plug in. I forgot to plug in my laptop here. It gives you time to, to look at that plot. Uh, the main point I just want to make here quickly is that the trace of the kimberlite uh, black line at the top is similar to what we see in the upper soil layers, even though that signal is, you know, orders of magnitude lower, as you would expect. You know, they, but we are seeing these rare earths come to the surface, but they they contain the character of the of the kimberlite in terms of its slope. And we use this a lot in igneous geology to characterize rocks. So when we go outside of that zone, we see the character of the slope change. And so it's not indicative of a kimberlite. And just to you know, point out that you know, we're seeing something that uh, I think is, a, is, an, is an actual response of the kimberlite at the surface. And we can use that data, rare earth data, also to look at gold occurrences. You know, here we've plotted it against uh, uh, structural trends uh, because a lot of the gold uh, distribution um, cat is dependent on, on uh, structural events. And potentially, we can use depletion and enrichment of the rare earths as a, as a proxy for uh, gold responses. And that's an interesting application that we're seeing these days. So, you know, I'm going to, to um, end this talk uh, with some conclusions where, you know, what, I, what we've seen is that uh, exploration funding 
in the last year uh, uh, has increased substantially. 2020 was one of the best years since the last peak in 2012. Uh, gold, as we've seen, you know, attracts a lot of the money, but we've seen recently a uh, boom in in uh, critical metals. You know, things like lithium, rare earths. You know, the governments and uh, uh, industrial users of these um, materials like uh, the gigafactories are recognizing that uh, many of these commodities uh, are in, could be in very short supply and that their supply chains could be threatened. And so we need mines uh, to supply this material. Um, and that has translated into an extremely uh, busy exploration season right now. Uh, I don't think you can find a geologist for love or money. And uh, we in the labs, and you know, we just run off our feet with the number of uh, uh, inquiries people are making on everything. You know, it's uh, um, <clears throat> it's not just gold; it's a wide range of commodities. Uh, so that's testing us to our limits in many ways. So uh, we are also seeing, you know, significant increases in the last year of uh, greenfields exploration. Something I have not seen since the since the late 90, mid 90s, in fact. Uh, and so, what we are, you know, uh, trying to offer to the exploration communities is MMI, MMI soil geochemistry is a very rapid me me way of surveying uh, large areas to see if there's potentially mineralization in that area. So I'm going to leave it at that, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, if you want to contact me later on, here's my uh, uh, email address and, and phone number. And uh, I will open it up to questions from the audience. Thank you for your attention. Hugh, thank you so much. You have given us a very articulate presentation today, which we have really enjoyed. Um, Let's look into the questions. First question for you is, what does the MMI extraction process consist of? Essentially, we take, uh, we don't do anything to the soil material. We don't dry it or screen it, um, but uh, we take 50 grams of soil in a, in a clean weighing area and put it into a vial. We add 50 mils of the extracting solution and uh, we shake it for 24 hours before we take it off and uh, extract, uh, take the liquid off and analyze the liquid with uh, an ICPMS uh, for those 53 or 54 elements. Uh, so compared to some of the other <coughs> chemical processes we have in the lab, it's relatively simple and Simple is good when you're doing thousands of samples. So sometimes, you know, we've seen 20,000 samples, 50,000 samples done in, in some of these uh, greenfield surveys. Excellent. And also, yeah. Sorry. <clears throat> you know, it's easier to keep the process consistent one sample to the next, and that's very important. Thank you. Second question, is the process of MMI sample collection complex and or labor intensive? In actual fact, it's much simpler than many of the other methods. You know, you're not going as deeply with as you are with B horizon sampling, which you have to deep, dig a very deep hole. And, you know, in some projects uh, they go to C horizon. So you have to dig quite, quite deeply or you have to use some type of mechanized Auger system to collect the sample. MMI, in contrast, uh, is very quick and easy. And <clears throat> importantly, in some areas, you know, where you know we've uh, been told by some of the native bands, whatever, that uh, you know they do not want to see environmental uh, residues or whatever from the sampling mechanism. We we don't leave an environmental footprint after the sampling, uh, and so we say, you know you can sample in an environmentally responsible or minimal way in, in many areas using the MMI process. So you, you dig your hole, you collect your sample and just fill it, in, fill it back in. Thank you. Uh, following with 
what type of species would you use for the MMI vegetation package? So in the Manitoba survey, you know, it was uh, older twigs. Uh, the ones I've seen most common are uh, bark samples, depending on what species is present in that area. Black spruce is, is one that's quite often widely distributed in some of these northern areas. There's an excellent book by Colin Dunn on biogeochemistry where he describes the various species in, in different terrains. Uh, I think in uh, in places like Nevada, we probably looked at uh, you know uh, some of those bushes that occur in um, um, in, in those types of terrains. Uh, in places like New Zealand, I think he's uh, sampled tree ferns, for example. Uh, we've sampled he's uh, I think he's sampled uh, a variety of species in the in the Australian outback as well. Uh, you know where it's shown that uh, you know these uh, long-growing uh, vegetation species uh, accumulate metals over periods of long periods of time, and their root systems are quite extensive and you know are good concentrators of uh, metals like gold. So biogeochemistry is quite important, but in any survey, once you pick a species, and you will do probably a, a survey of your area to see which is the most abundant species, you will stick to that. And, and you know, if you're con collecting cones, uh, you stick to cones or bark, you stick to barks. One of the interesting ones I've seen recently, which is probably quite exciting for the uh, samplers, is they hang somebody out of a helicopter and they snip off the treetops, you know, Douglas firs and so on. So uh, that's an interesting. Uh, <clears throat> lifestyle choice for the geochemist, I guess, you know, in very, very wooded terrains and very steep mountain slopes. Thank you. Your concluding observations for the market were very insightful. What do you foresee for critical metals? I, you know, um, if this uh, Biden infrastructure plan goes through and you know you see increasing electrification of of uh, a whole range of things uh, you know broadband extension and everything else we're going to need a huge amount of these critical metals uh, and that you know everything from copper and nickel uh, to cobalt to uh, the rare earth elements uh, lithium uh, you know, it, it's uh, it's going to put a huge strain on the on the supply chain, and you know, in in the mining press, and people are talking about a super cycle. You know, I'm I'm beginning to believe that might happen, um, and uh, I think you know that could be uh, very important for Canada. Um, and what is interesting, you know, not just this technology, but other ones, uh, our core scanning technology that we are using to help exploration go faster, is that we've seen some early exploration phases where, you know, people are after a particular target, it's, for example, copper or gold, and then we, they look at this data at a very early stage, you know, within days of uh, uh, extracting the core, and they see other critical metals appearing there that might change their minds about what they're targeting. So we, we, with the new technologies that we are putting out there that SGS is focused on is we're trying to cater to a new exploration styles and provide explorations with a lot of different tools to improve their success. Thank you. Are you seeing more companies focus on critical metals given the additional funding for exploration? Oh yes, I think uh, we've seen certainly a big increase in our rare earth and lithium uh, um, um, requests, particularly on the metallurgical side, um, because within our complex at Lakefield, we have an incredible group of uh, metallurgists and mineral processors who are, you know, I think they've, they've looked at the most rare number of rare earth deposits in the world. You know, so every every project, uh, whether it's in uh, the US or Canada, or whether it's in Africa or Greenland, uh, eventually 
something will end up at Lakefield. So the 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 in a sense, uh, they experienced you know wide range of projects, a wide range of rare earth types. So in just looking at rare earths, you know we've we've looked at the carbonatite occurrences, we've looked at the alkaline type uh, alkaline sills uh, occurrences, but we've also looked at ionic clays where it's kind of just leach and extract. Uh, we've seen quite a few of these. These are the big uh, uh, supplies in, in the Chinese uh, uh, sphere is this ionic clay. Uh, they, a lot of their rare earths comes from that. And so these are big targets, but geochemically, I don't believe explorations have looked for it. And, but suddenly we are seeing that uh, we can use things like MMI to recognize uh, these ionic clay deposits at the surface because they're all surface occurrences. So if you ran an MMI survey, you would see in the rare earth response uh, uh, an ionic clay deposit. I'm, I'm pretty sure about that. And I think we're gonna see a big increase in that application. Thank you, Hugh. That brings us to the ends of our questions. Um, Thank you for our most comprehensive presentation today, which we have all thoroughly enjoyed. We look forward to following SGS on the web and you can find it on sgs.com. Thank you again. Thank you, Hugh, for joining us today. We appreciate your time. In closing, uh, thank you all for joining. May I invite you to join us in a month's time. Next month's speaker will be Ken Murray on the vicious cycle on the mining industry business model. Please look out for the details of this talk that will take place on May 27, the last Thursday in May. We would like to acknowledge once again our sponsor, SGS, for your continued support. We are very grateful. And our CIM GTA co-chairs, Mary Murray and Phil Kinsilla, Michelle Silliers for her seamless organization of today's event. Thank you, Michelle. We also thank John Thompson as treasurer of CIMG TA West and lifetime member of the CIM for joining us on today's session. Our tremendous speaker, Hugh, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much for your time again and our immense thanks to you, CIMG TA West members for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you again on May 27 and enjoy the rest of your day and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.